Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, establish my covenant with you, that I never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Thank you very much. Our scripture passage this morning is a continuation of the story that we just heard at kids' time. And I have to admit, a perk of preaching this week was I didn't have to do something different for both. I could tell you that it wasn't, you know, it was a reason to not do extra work, but that's so not true because I forgot just how much work goes into preparing for Bible study. Before we explore the passage that Hope just read, let us go back for a minute to catch a few details that we didn't hear with the kids' time, and then a little bit um, of chapter 9 before um, Ms. Hope read. Um, So we were talking about in Bible study just how much time they spent on the ark. And if you're that kind of person that wants to go back and look at all the details and start adding up days and weeks and whatnot um, from getting on the ark to getting off the ark, you'll find that it was about 377 days of quality time in that tiny space with your family and lots of smelly animals. I couldn't imagine doing that. So it kind of makes sense to me that the first thing they do when they get off the boat is build an altar to God and thank God, probably one, that they're off the boat, two, that there's dry land, and three, that they have a new beginning. So the first thing that they do in the uh, thanking God is they do a burnt offering Um, This is something that we don't do in our culture anymore. Um, But they gave God a burnt offering of the clean animals on the ark, the birds, the animals, all that good stuff. So one set. And the the smell was pleasing to God. And my dark humor, I would say that it was probably the first barbecue recorded in history. Um, But this is the beginning where God makes a covenant with humanity. Um, The beginning of chapter 9 gives the details of the covenant. And in Bible study, we talked about the different writers of the Old Testament. There's the J writer, and there's the priestly writer, and there's this one and that one. And if you go back and you look at Scripture, you can see parts where it says, God did this, and you could look back in parts of the story, and it says, the Lord did that. And that's the indication of where the writers changed. So it was kind of like one sibling was telling a story and had some details, and the other sibling had better details. Um, So you get part of the covenant at the end of chapter 8, and then you get some really specific details in chapter 9. And this covenant was made with Noah and his descendants, and then everyone else for all of time. It didn't just pertain to them in that moment, but it also included the living animals. Um, This covenant is the first one that was made and serves as the foundation for every covenant that came afterward. It was a renewal of a relationship with God where God recognizes that no matter what has happened, people are still going to sin. God tells Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply and go to the ends of the earth. And as I told the kids, hold on to that for next week so we can learn more about how we didn't do what God told us to do in our next chapter. Um, The earlier verses affirms God's goodness of creation again and reminds us that we are to care for all of it. 
not just the people and the things that we like, but for all of it. For some people, this is the beginning of an argument about whether we're called to care or whether we're called to dominate, but that's not where we're going to go, where we're going to go there. But what I did catch in my pre preparation for Bible study this week was I had forgotten completely, even though Jeff and I were Adam and Eve and we're supposed to listen to what God said a few weeks ago, God called us to be vegetarians up until the flood. Did you guys know that? You're really good, smart people. You knew that, and I just forgot. And it wasn't until this covenant where God gives permission to eat of the animals, but then, of course, gives instructions. That they have to be clean, and what it means to be clean is for all the blood to be taken out of the animal, which then has to go with a reminder of do not drink blood, which also probably goes to show that God was not in favor of vampires. Ah, thank you for that laugh. It was a good one. Um, God has to go through another set of instructions like, do not kill people again. So you think it would be ending there, but then God says, also don't eat people because you're not supposed to eat people. And then goes on to remind people that even though we have permission to eat of the flesh of animals, it's still killing and that murderers are held accountable to God. And for some, this is the beginning of the argument about capital punishment. But again, we're not going there this morning. But everyone is accountable to God. And the thing that I like the best is that God reaffirms that we are still made in the image of God, even though we screwed up again. So to get back to our verses from this morning, God establishes this covenant for all generations with all living things with this expectation of love and care. It's also, for me, an understanding of a, an act of grace and forgiveness. This covenant doesn't have to be renewed again. And I appreciate the fact that God needs a reminder to not wipe out humanity again with a flood. God didn't invent the rainbow for the sake of this covenant. God probably just looked around and was like, okay, you can see it here, I can see it there. Rainbow, this is the sign of our covenant that I will not annihilate you people again. At this stage in our story of God's people, I haven't quite decided if we were more like toddlers in our terrible twos or petulant teenagers that God didn't know what to do with. But whether we were toddlers or teenagers, I'm glad that God didn't give up on us. I'm glad that God stuck with us then and sticks with us still when we actively choose to make bad choices. God promises to not annihilate the floodwaters. And as one pointed out in Bible study, it didn't mean that we couldn't come up with things to destroy our earth on our own. It just meant that God promised that he wasn't going to do it again, but he also didn't promise that there wouldn't be consequences for our actions. So to me, that sounds very parental because let me tell you, I heard so many times that there would be consequences for my actions. I was a good child. <laughs> I love that this covenant is a reminder of hope. The flood was caused by the troubles of people, but the fall doesn't mean that God stopped working with humans then. It doesn't mean that God stopped working to, to trust us. And it doesn't mean that we don't still have that ability to work with God and for God to trust us now. But this covenant recognizes that we make mistakes. Even though we're made in this perfect image of God, we make mistakes. We choose to say terrible things. We choose to do awful things to people and awful things to our world. But this covenant that God made with Noah and Noah's descendants remind us that this covenant goes on forever, that we have a new beginning with God. My question this morning is for us to look at the ways that we are experiencing new beginnings in our lives, in these places where we can start again, where we can get out of the boat 
and live into the fullness of God's promise. In Bible study this week, we talked about a list of ways that we experience new beginnings, and you could kind of tell that we're at this back-to-school season when part of my list included kids going back to school and youth going back to school and teachers going back to school and parents going back to school and you know, we have this season of newness. Maybe it's your first day of kindergarten. Maybe it's your first day with your new teacher and your new desk with your slightly new book in your classroom. Maybe you're getting ready to graduate high school. Maybe this new beginning is starting college. We have people in our congregation leaving for college this week. Maria Hansen leaves. We chatted this morning. I asked her if she was excited or nervous, and she kind of indicated both. They told her about my experience when I left for college. I was smug. I was so excited. It was going to be great. I was going like 12 hours away from my family, and it was going to be perfect. And I moved into my dorm room on my own, and then I sat on my bed and cried. But I did not call home to admit that I was not happy because I was so smug. It was going to be great. It was a new beginning, but it was also so tough. They told Maria if she didn't quite want to admit to being nervous and not liking it, that she could call me and I could commiserate with her. But for some, these new beginnings are graduating college and getting that first job. The Tuttle shared in the first service that their daughter that just got her PhD got a job this week. And that's a great And then that new beginning is when you get your first paycheck and then you learn how much you don't actually make. Maybe it's meeting the love of your life or getting married or having a family. For some, maybe it means getting a divorce or ending a relationship. A new beginning is the day after you celebrate your 50th wedding anniversary. Maybe it's retiring or moving. Maybe it's the change of one's health situation, the death of a loved one, and so much more. For some, a new beginning happens on January 1st. For others, it happens on December 31st. One person said that we experience these new beginnings every single day because we are a work in progress. These new beginnings offer us an opportunity to be truly thankful for everything in our lives. So where do you experience new beginnings? I was talking with Brenda before she left on vacation about the service, and we sat down to talk about all the different working parts, and she said, okay, so where are you going to go with this? And I said, well, I'm going to look at it from, you know, new beginnings, and she said, well, if you're asking people to look at where their new beginnings are, what are your new beginnings? And so I kind of go with the, oh, yeah, when I went to college, that was a new beginning, and when I went to seminary, that was a new beginning, and When I left ministry in Texas and moved here, that was a really new beginning. And she said, no, 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 no. More obvious than that. What is a new beginning you are heading towards? I'm like, oh, I'm getting married. (laughs) That's a pretty new beginning. And, you know, Jeff and I are figuring out what all this stuff means and there are details. And in 61 days, we're getting married in this very room. And you guys are all very much invited to celebrate with us as we start our new life together. And I've been assured that this new beginning is is very much just that. It's an adventure. It's an exercise in love and grace and forgiveness and patience. (laughs) With my job, I see new beginnings every day. That might be one of the most favorite things I see. You might want to call it a transition. You might want to call it a concern. You might want to call it a joy. But one of the things I get to do is I get to see these places in each of your lives where we grow and where we struggle. Next week, we get to bless our children and youth as they head back to school and selfishly. I am so excited about going to the store in the middle of the day without hearing lots of kids around. I love you people, but I like having my adult time too. We also see places where these new beginnings are hard, where maybe we haven't gotten off the boat. Maybe we are stuck amongst the floodwaters 
Maybe we can't see that rainbow or that sign of hope because we're just stuck. These stuck places happen when we deal with health issues and life changes and loss. The death of a loved one, maybe it's getting older, maybe it's a fear of having to adapt or get run over. Maybe it's just change in general. Let's be honest here. Does anybody really like change? I don't. I hate change. I claim to love change. The reality is, I don't. When I was little, I would get so frustrated when people would sit in my pew at church that I would stare them down until they moved. And I didn't realize just how unwelcoming that was (laughs) until I came to visit here shortly after I moved and I sat in someone else's pew. (laughs) And I didn't know any different. And I'm so glad you guys still love me because I didn't make that mistake twice. So the next week I sat in someone else's pew and then someone else's pew and someone else's pew. And that's fine. New beginnings can be exciting. And let's admit it, they can be scary. They can be hope-filled. They can be horrifying. There's nothing wrong if we get a little bit stuck on a boat. What becomes a place where it's troublesome is when we refuse to move forward, when we refuse to take a leap of faith. But that's okay, because we're not in this alone. We have each other. We very obviously have God. And it'll be just fine. It takes faith to do these things. It takes faith to live through and live into these new beginnings. In our community of faith here at Hillview, We're experiencing a new beginning with our pastor. We welcomed Pastor Brenda last month, kind of, as we said goodbye to Pastor Barbara. I don't know about you, but it's so hard to do that all in the course of a week. We might have had a Sunday in between, but that was five years of ministry with Pastor Barbara where we learned her ins and outs and her passions and the things that just made her tick and it helped shape the ministries here at Hillview. And none of those were bad things. They were great things. They helped us move forward. Some things we liked, some things we didn't, and that's okay. We grow, we change, we live into new beginnings. And then we kind of welcomed Pastor Brenda when she came the 1st of July. It's not that we didn't want her here. It's not that we weren't excited. But we didn't really name that we were grieving, that we were a little bit stuck on a boat. I know what it's like to be the new kid on a block. I also know that it's kind of tough when you kind of have to introduce yourself on your first day. It's nice to do something wonderful and welcoming, and I'm glad that we have an opportunity to do just that, but in our own sort of Hillview way of doing it. We have a couple opportunities in the next few weeks to live into a new beginning, to celebrate these, and as Brenda Carpentier stood up this morning and shared one way, I think it's nice to put a card in her basket Maybe include something like, I love the Sidewalk Art Chalk Festival. Please put this on your calendar for next year. You would love it. Maybe I will invite Pastor Brenda to come and experience Guido's Pizza with me because I think it's the best basil cheese pizza in the universe. Maybe you've thought about wanting to invite her over to your house for dinner. She loves doing things like that. I bet she will invite a number of you to come visit her home and to have that opportunity. There is nothing better than building a community of faith over a meal. Maybe it's a cup of coffee, coffee, coffee. (laughs) Maybe it is your favorite soap made at your favorite store with local goods that you put in a basket. The only thing I ask is please don't make it be like a living, squirmy thing. But what a better way to welcome her back after her much-deserved vacation. She worked all last year without one. And I'm so grateful that we have given her the ability to take one when she got here. 
so she can come back refreshed and renewed, ready to move forward, to continue to celebrate these new beginnings, to put life into different spaces of our ministries to help them move forward. That's not to say that we're stuck. That's also not to say that we're not doing things. But I have to admit that there is a new, there's a newness to everything. Bible study seems new. Worship seems new. The bulletin seems new. There are these new places where we can get excited about, where we can reignite our passions for serving people, for feeding people, for learning. Another opportunity to celebrate a new beginning, as I said earlier, was next Sunday. The children and youth are invited to come and bring their backpacks or just come and let us bless them for the year of school ahead. The one that's my favorite and probably the most self-serving is Rally Day. I love that we have an opportunity to celebrate all of the wonderful opportunities for Christian education in our congregation. Not only can you sign up for Sunday school or learn more about a new short-term class, but you can also make your best side dish or salad and dessert and come and have lunch with 200 of your closest friends. You can also play games, and we rented a bounce house. Who doesn't love a bounce house? And who doesn't love an opportunity to renew friendships, to break bread with one another, to catch up on our lives together, and to fellowship with each other? I love these spaces where we can start anew. Last week, Pastor Brenda told you to stay in the boat. This week, I'm telling you to get out of the boat. It sounds like we went to two very different seminaries, and I've come at this from two very different places. And it also sounds so contradictory. Just trust me on this one. We need to have the faith that Pastor Brenda talked about last week to be secure and stay in the boat. Even when the waves are crashing, when bad things are happening in our lives, even when bad things are happening in our church that we don't like, we need to look around. We need to see when the waters recede. We need to take that leap of faith, and we need to step out of the boat and move forward and not turn around and assess the damage of what had happened, but move forward living into this covenant, living into the fullness of, of this new beginning that God offered Noah and his descendants years and years ago that we get to live into today. So what does this new beginning look like? For some, it might be starting a new job. It might be a new relationship. It might be changing a no into a yes. Heck, it might be someone volunteering to teach Sunday school. Maybe it's signing up for a new class, trying that Bible study you always wanted to go to that looked interesting that you never had time to go to. Maybe it is saying goodbye to a relationship. Maybe it's saying goodbye to a place of toxicity in your life. And maybe it's saying hello to someone new, to a new friendship, to a new way of thinking, to a new way of living. But whatever it is, this new beginning, this is an act of faith. This new beginning can heal places of hurt. It can heal places of brokenness. But at the heart of it, it serves as a reminder of God's hope and God's love and God's presence in each of our lives. And also of God's unending love. And may all of this be so. Amen. Will you please stand with me as we sing This is the Nay of New Beginnings? <laughs>